Hey guys, Dr. Gooden here, and I wanted to talk to you about the difference between high load multi joint movements and low load single joint movements. Um, and I'll just talk about the benefits of each, and then you can go about figuring out how to implement these into your resistance training programs. So, multi joint movements first. Now, some of the benefits of multi joint movements um, are that they develop greater inter and intramuscular coordination. When you're having to use an entire muscle group in order to coordinate more than one joint at a time, um, it tends to allow you to transfer this movement to... Yeah, I'm actually filming um, a video right now. Okay, when I come upstairs, I'll finish it. Okay, can you go upstairs and tell mommy that it's a, this is a microphone. Can you not touch it, please? Look, you're on, you're on the video now. Say hi. Hi. So let's say that you're doing a back squat. Well, because you're having to coordinate muscles that move the ankle and the knee and the hip, now those muscles um, uh, can can uh, take can take that new strength that they're developing, and actually you can apply it better when you're jumping or when you're sprinting. Um, the next uh, benefit is that they help to develop global strength, so the strength of the entire organism, um, a type of coordinated strength that you don't necessarily get with single joint movements. Um, it also, uh, multi-joint movements ensure symmetry and balance. It doesn't mean you'll be perfectly symmetrical right to left or even front to back, but at least if you're using all of the muscles in a certain muscle group, you tend to have um, less of a chance of developing an, an overactivity or a dominance of a certain muscle group. For instance, let's say you spend a lot of time doing a single joint uh, bicep curl, well, perhaps your biceps now start to take over in any type of a pulling or rowing movement that you do, leading to a further underactivation of your back musculature. And now every time you go to pull something, uh, like pull a door or um, it, maybe you're in the weight room and you're doing rows, you tend to just want to use your bicep because you're used to training that and you have that good mind-muscle connection, right? But if we actually uh, maybe take out some of the bicep curls and do more uh, rows and chin-ups and pull-ups, now we can coordinate uh, you know, our shoulder girdle stabilizing muscles and our lats with our biceps and have that good synchronous pulling movement pattern. Um, and they're usually, these multi-joint movements are usually better suited to medium to low repetition ranges. And this is because we can use a higher load with these lifts, right? So you can, um, you can bench press quite a bit more weight than you can tricep uh, do on a tricep extension. And, you know, it's due to a lot of reasons, partially because the bench press is close, a closed chain movement, also because now we have the pecs and the triceps and the anterior delts involved in that movement. Um, you can brace your entire body and stabilize as you're pushing the bar away from you, um, and you can get greater nervous system activation in it. So we can use those heavier loads to cause high mechanical tension, right? We want to raise mechanical tension um, in order to stimulate growth and strength in the muscle. Uh, and so, and we tend to not want to do that for super duper high reps, very close to failure. So, you know, sets from anywhere, uh, you know, from one to two, uh, training for maximum strength, uh, uh, or even up to five for, for basic strength. And then even up to 10 and 12 might be kind of the upper limit if you're training for strength endurance or hypertrophy. Occasionally you can go over that, but usually you want to stick to sets up to 12. Now, single joint movements, uh, these are great for isolating specific areas or lagging body parts. So let's say you have uh, maybe, maybe you're a quad dominant, right? Like we looked at uh, previously in the semester, we have an athlete who's quad dominant. Uh, they have underactive or possibly underdeveloped hamstring musculature. Maybe we want to, we want to target those hamstrings. And so we could do some sort of a hamstring isolation movement that involves either um, <clears throat> knee flexion or hip extension or both at the same time. Maybe it's Nordic hamstring curls, maybe it's stiff leg deadlifts, maybe it's um, you know a, a seated hamstring curl, what have you. <clears throat> and we just cannot use as much load on this type of a single joint movement. So let's say that you can deadlift 300 pounds well, you're definitely not going to be able to uh, leg curl 300 pounds, right? Um, and we have to use much less load because now we're focusing all of that stress onto an individual muscle, and that's okay. We shouldn't necessarily chase higher, higher weight numbers, high load numbers in single joint exercises. Really, we should be going for that mind-muscle connection. We should be chasing the burn. We should be maybe, you know, micro-dosing load over time, just little 
additions here and there a couple times during a training block as we also add repetitions or add sets to increase the volume of single joint training. Um, they, single joint training requires lower amounts of psychological arousal, lower central nervous system output. So it's ten, it tends to be easier. This is why we save single joint training for the end of a training session. Um, so the way you might wanna structure it is multi-joint movements first in the training session and then as you progress and you're getting more and more tired throughout that hour or 45 minutes of training, after you've done your multi-joint lifts, now we transition and we do some of our single joint lifts. So let's say it's an upper body day and you're doing push and pull movements. So maybe you do some sort of a bench press movement and then you do a loaded chin up movement. Uh, and those are your two upper body multi-joint movements. We have a push and we have a pull working opposite muscle groups. And then maybe you can hit some isolation movements at the end, uh, maybe some bicep curls, some tricep extensions, uh, maybe you know dumbbell lateral raises, working on those individual muscles because we still have some energy left. Maybe we can't get as much out of the bench press and the chin-ups anymore because we've done those big movement patterns and we're too tired to continue to really push those movements, but we still have enough energy left for our training session to hit those smaller movements. And we can train a little bit closer to failure because these uh, isolation movements tend to be less inherently dangerous. We don't have a big bar on our back. We're not um, you know, uh, using multiple joints and having to coordinate them. Uh, in worst case, you just drop the dumbbell or you stop the set and they tend to be uh, not very dangerous at all. Now, that said, we wanna use lower loads here because of that direct stress on the muscle. If you're chasing a PR and you're, you know, one RM bicep curl, that's a good way to get some sort of um, a tendon injury or a connective tissue injury. So we tend to want to do these for slightly higher reps, you know, sets of eight to 10 or above up to maybe 20 or more. And you can tend to train these a little closer to failure, maybe one rep from failure or even uh, all the way to failure in certain, certain circumstances. Um, a note on tension uh, before I go. So mechanical tension is important for muscle growth. And so we wanna think about how can we train these muscles through their full range of motion. Maybe in a multi-joint movement, we don't get our muscles quite to the full range of motion. Okay, so maybe you're doing a reverse lunge um, specifically to target the glutes. Well, the glute max might not go through its full range of motion. It might not be fully stretched at the bottom of your reverse lunge um, because your hip flexion angle is only at 90 degrees or so. So instead we might wanna switch Right? So maybe we do our, our, um, our reverse lunge and then now we switch to some sort of glute isolation movement or a couple glute, glute isolation movements, maybe a, uh, you know, a single leg hip thrust or something where we can get a greater uh, hip, flex, hip flexion angle at the bottom of the movement um, and then really lock it out of the top and squeeze those glutes and get higher reps as well. Or what you can do is uh, change your reverse lunge. So now instead of being upright, in your lunge, keeping your torso upright. Maybe you're leaning forward slightly um, so that at the bottom position of that lift, your glutes have greater mechanical tension and now you're training them through a more full range of motion. You can uh, make these small tweaks to your exercises um, either in the multi-joint movements or sometimes in single joint movements as well. Um, but it's all about training, trying to train the muscle through the full range of motion um, and picking the correct exercise and then altering techniques slightly in order to find it, depending on what muscle group you're trying to emphasize. All right, guys, that's all for now. Uh, those are some tips for this week's assignment, and I'm looking forward to seeing your videos.